We've known from the beginning of the current pandemic that there is obviously a link between uh, coronavirus fatality and advanced age. It's one of the things we're most sure of at this point. Um, but there's a lot more that we are learning and that theoretically could be learned about age and not only the current pandemic, but also future threats that we one day might have to face. And joining us now to uh, hopefully shed light a little bit on what we can uh, hopefully learn from future research into aging, Keith Camito, president of Lifespan.io. Welcome to the show. Glad to have you here. Great. Thanks for having me. So uh, I want to start off by talking about your organization. You're the president of Lifespan. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what that organization is tasked with uh, with doing? What are you concerned with? Sure. Lifespan.io is a 501c3 nonprofit whose mission is basically to raise funds and awareness for research aimed at extending healthy human lifespan by addressing the root causes of the aging process itself rather than the downstream effects of, you know, disease specific, um, you know, uh, progression. Like think of it like treating the trunk of a tree as opposed to a branch of a branch. And so as as a general rule, um, like I, I guess it's difficult to quantify, but what what roughly what percentage of current research going into aging is focused on the trunk as opposed to, I guess, the branches in this metaphor? Uh, the short answer is vastly not enough. Uh, to use an analogy, let's say uh, the National Cancer Institute, let's say, gets six billion dollars about per year, uh, which is, you know, an end stage disease. But if you were to contrast that about 200 million dollars. Uh, through the NIA, the National Institute on Aging, goes to this sort of core mechanism research. And that includes um, looking into genetic instability, which causes pretty much all cancers and a lot of other things. So mm -hmm. you can see right there, there's a little bit of illogic in, in how the budget is allocated. Exactly. And you mentioned there the NIA, their budget was recently cut additionally, correct? Yes, that is correct by, I believe, about 450 million, I want to say. Okay. So at the same time that that perhaps some of their research focus should be re shifted. It also seems like they're gonna need some more resources if they're gonna do that sort of research. Um, so I wanna, I wanna touch base with COVID-19 because you recently had an online round table that dealt with uh, COVID-19, aging, and, and the future of healthcare. Can you tell me a little bit of uh, what was discussed at this round table? Sure, so this round table basically was a follow-up of a piece that we did on lifespan.io. So if anyone wants to read it, you can go to lifespan.io slash COVID risk and you should be able to find it. And it's basically given the fact that, as we've all seen the charts, uh, aging is a huge is the primary risk factor basically for COVID-19, a huge disproportionate effect amongst the elderly, which is also true of pretty much every other disease, whether it's infectious or not. You know, Alzheimer's, cancer, influenza. If you look at the charts of mortality and age, it's pretty much the same chart. COVID is a little bit more extreme, but you know, same uh, style. So what the roundtable was about was uh, some of the people on it were also um, the former director of the NIA, actually, who had just stepped down like the day before. So I wanted to, you know, get yeah. him now that he was free to speak, basically saying, hey, you know, since we all know this in the biological research community and the fact that the government is not prioritizing this, what are some strategies on how we can actually get that to happen? Because if the government does uh, reprioritize that research. Uh, not only is it research into the core mechanisms of aging, but if you wanted to pin it to just say uh, immune system decline, there's a lot of very promising research right now that's underfunded, including uh, the study that uh, you covered actually on your show with Greg Fay mm -hmm. uh, a couple of months ago for immune system uh, regeneration, essentially. Mm -hmm. And if we can fund that research and if it's successful, not only would it make everyone less um, likely to get COVID, it would also decrease the communicability of it, you know, or not would go down. And there's been some economists like Andrew Scott in the UK who've been showing that just by crunching the numbers, you know, if you were to reduce the communicability because of this, it could cut the death rate down to 30% of what it is now. So basically in the round table, it's like, how do we how do we get the government to care about this? And that's not too dissimilar from kind of what you guys do at TYT of, you know, building up a grassroots movement around some credible research, highlighting it, maybe coming up with some draft, draft legislation and driving attention uh, towards that. So that's what we're in the process mm -hmm. of now. So you mentioned there that obviously doing that sort of research hypothetically could lead to fewer fatalities overall. But also you said if it's less communicable, then theoretically like we're all looking forward to, are we going to have lockdowns for the second wave of coronavirus in the fall or hypothetically other, uh, you know, other coronaviruses or other uh, things that could come later on. So it seems like while we should all agree 
that lowering the number of fatalities is, is obviously a good priority. Right now, there's this huge partisan divide on the on stressing stopping the lockdown as quickly as possible. It seems like that would be a pretty good way to advertise um, that sort of research. Yes. So the good point here is that aging and the diseases of aging are the ultimate nonpartisan issue, right? It affects everyone. Uh, but to your point, we, you know, as advocates have to figure out the right ways to, you know, phrase that and message that. So in terms of the lockdown, here's an important statistic or, or important relevant fact. You know, we all have the dream of when the vaccine comes out, right, that'll help protect us, not only solve the COVID situation, but for future pandemics, we want to get vaccines. But vaccines don't work on the elderly well at all because their immune systems are compromised. Yes. So in order for any of that to work at all, you know, it's it's a huge economic benefit if we can improve immune system function amongst the population. So, again, yeah. that's that's a point that's always glossed over when people talk about the holy grail of the vaccine. Interesting. And, um, you know, turning aside from from the current pandemic, um, you know, you were talking about TYT, obviously, the, the vast majority of TYT, very supportive of uh, proposals like Medicare for All. You've talked about how um, turning a, a bit more of the focus to aging research could hypothetically help to create a sustainable system like Medicare for All. How, how would that work exactly? Yeah, uh, I guess one phrase that's used that I that I, I like a lot, it was said by Brian Kennedy, a researcher, was is um, aging is the climate change of healthcare. Basically, we have a looming demographic problem on our hands. Uh, sometimes it's called the gray tsunami. You can look up, you know, UN statistics that show um, that the population is aging. So, for example, uh, right now, I believe 13 percent of the population is over 60. But by uh, 2050, that'll be 21 percent. And by 2100, that'll be 27 percent. So you can see that not just Medicare for all, but a lot of the social safety net systems like Social Security, they're predicated on the fact that there's enough young, able-bodied, healthy people paying into the system to sustain it, right? So as you can see, also birth rates are down. So basically the equation is moving badly in both directions. Mm -hmm. Society is getting older, birth rates are down. So we need to get better about actually pro uh, promoting better preventative health care and basically addressing the root causes of the aging process, which can be addressed now. Um, that is the ultimate preventative health care. Mm -hmm. That's the way to sort of align it, I think, with m messages like Medicare for All. It's like this is the ultimate preventative health care. So you know, I, this is a huge question, obviously. But so what, what what can be done hypothetically? Is it just a is it a matter of more research dollars? Is it about the federal government providing guidance to researchers working for the government to turn their their research to different things? What, what are some of the, the, the changes that you'd like to see made? Yeah, so I think the most instructive example to look at here is what the cancer advocates did in like the 1940s. It was basically a three pronged approach. They found the most credible research and through, you know, their own like private means, were trying to raise money. Crowdfunding. We do crowdfunding too at Lifespan.io. Uh, so that's one aspect, you know, trying to incentivize uh, investment in companies. So we have investor networks trying to get them to learn about this new field that could be a, you know, a good buying opportunity, et cetera, right? Because mm -hmm. healthcare is going to be basically so. Uh, important in the future. That's one side of it. But then while you're doing that, you build up a grassroots movement to eventually, uh, you know, put some pressure on the government for, for the cancer advocates. It was the 1961 um, Cancer Act, where basically these few advocates, they built up that pressure and they were taking like full page spreads in the New York Times uh, that were basically saying, Nixon, what the hell are you doing? We're dying here. Mm -hmm. So the analog here is we should really put together and we're working on this now. That's what the panel was about. Some draft legislation, even if it's overly simplistic, you know, one percent of the GDP should go to the NIA budget to be allocated in this way. Um, that would be something that can get the conversation started. So we're looking to sort of leverage all the momentum that we've built up around very credible research. It's undeniable. Um, you know, no snake oil, because obviously history has been, you know, rife with that uh, <laughs> to, to really sort of put a fine point on like this is doable. This would be a vast socioeconomic benefit, not to mention all the untracked cost of it, you know, mental health, young people not able to start their lives because they're taking care of their parents with Alzheimer's, etc. It would just be a massive like socioeconomic, emotional, philosophical, moral good. So we need to drive that home. So we need help. Everyone help us. <laughs> and it seems like the perfect time for it, too. I think we could all use a bit of that. Uh, Keith yeah. Mito, president of uh, Lifespan.io. Uh, thank you so much. We appreciate you joining us today. Sure. Take care.
Check out the Damage Report podcast each day, wherever you get your podcasts, whether Pocket Casts or Stitcher or iTunes. You can join me as I give you the news and stories you want, with a range of co-hosts and interview guests jumping in on the fun each day. Again, that's the Damage Report, wherever you get your podcasts. And if you get them at iTunes, don't forget to rate and review. Sometimes I'll read them live on the show.